All right, hello, 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 we are live. And today we're gonna to be talking about what does it really mean to be a spiritual person? What does it really mean to be a light worker? And of course, this is all my opinion, this is all my experience, you, no one has to agree with me, but I'm just gonna be sharing my perspective on what I think it really means to be spiritual. Hello, Thomas. Um, what it means to be a light worker on the planet right now, what is actually of value, what is actually of service to people, what is of service to ourselves, what is of service to humanity, and the things that can kind of just be a little bit distractions on the path. Because not that these things aren't important or exciting or have no value, just that there might be something deeper to what it really means to be a light worker, a spiritual person, a conscious person, whatever we want to call it, um, here on the planet. So I want to start kind of just going for it, because why not? So the first thing that I really want to talk about with being a light worker and being a spiritual person, being someone who considers yourself to be someone who wants to evolve the planet, someone who wants to evolve humanity, someone who wants to evolve themselves, whether you're not, whether or not you're considering yourself like a light worker in the sense of like, I do these things for others and I, I have this platform or I have this job or this is, this is something I do for a living or anything like that. Or if you literally just consider yourself just a spiritual person in your life, in your day to day, this is how I live my life. These are my values. These are my this is just how I live my life, but I kind of look like a normal person, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. We're talking about what, is it, what does it mean to be a light worker? And again, I want to go really deep here, just off the start, because this is what it's all really about, okay? So what we need to recognize is that as a human race, as a human species, we are dealing with the questions, the existential crises of what happens when I die, right? What came before life? What comes after life? And within that, within the fear of death and the fear of what comes before and after, is the what is it that makes life meaningful, right? Th this, we're all struggling with this still semi, not primitive, but just basic trying to survive, okay? And I think that, again, we in the Western world can sometimes forget that for most of humanity, survival was no guarantee. For most of humanity, Humans didn't live past 30 or 40. For most of humanity, being a human was literally struggling against the elements, struggling against infectious disease, struggling against famine, struggling against where is food and shelter and protection from predators going to come from. And that is a deep core wound that every human being is still carrying in their lineage. That just because in the Western world we've reached sanitation, we've reached medication that took us out of literally dying in our 40s from infectious diseases, dying in our 40s, and you know, it's even, we kind of have to acknowledge this as well, right? Like that we can, we look at the Western world and the Western way of living, and I'm saying Western in quotes, because I hope we all know what I'm talking about, like sanitation, medicine, um, governmental systems, cities, all these things that we kind of have. We look at that, that system as negative. A lot of us really look at all of that and think like, we're disconnected from nature, we're disconnected from the natural way of things, that's not a good thing. And again, we sort of have to take a step back and just be like, okay, even the indigenous tribes that are still living to this day, that are completely connected to nature, that are not necessarily getting lifestyle diseases, 
They're not getting diabetes. They're not getting heart attacks. They're not getting any of these things. They're dying still in their 30s and 40s. Okay, so I'm not saying unnatural is the best. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that we do have to acknowledge that the Western lifestyle took us from death at 40 to death at 60, 70, 80. Yes, and I understand that there are the blue zones, that there are places on the planet where people are living a really long time with or without modern technology, but those places also still have sanitation. They have, they have kind of modern ways of doing things. So we just kind of have to remember that just historically speaking, the thing that took us out of dying in our 30s and 40s to living into our 60s, 70s, and 80s, where we can live long enough to get a chronic disease, where we can live long enough to, to get diabetes, to get arthritis, to get heart disease, happened at least in part because of medication and sanitation. So unnatural ways of living. And I know that that can be a real hard thing because like a lot of us, especially in the, the detox and the health world, want to believe that if we all just go back to the Garden of Eden, that there's this utopia of living naturally that will get rid of all of our problems. And it's kind of like, no, because we have that. There are people who are living on the planet who are living in that utopia. And maybe it's great for the 40 years, but then they die. They don't necessarily die of a heart attack. They don't necessarily die of diabetes or chronic disease, but they're still dying very young compared to us. So we can't black and white this. We can't black and white anything. And I think that that's part of my definition of a spiritual person, is someone who can take all the evidence and say, okay, it doesn't necessarily fit one perfect narrative. So we're struggling with this idea of survival. And we have been struggling with this idea of survival for all of human history. And that is a major, major trauma. Okay? To have self-awareness. Okay? And again, fundamentally, this is the human conundrum. That we came into self-awareness. We're aware of ourselves. We became aware of our mortality. We became aware of this idea of I wasn't here now I'm here, and then I'm watching as all these people that I love g disappear. They die. And we have no idea what the heck that is. We don't know how to find security, right? Like this whole, we can plan for the future, we can ruminate on the past, all these things that we're supposedly saying like animals don't have. It's a lot and it's traumatizing and it traumatized us so humanity coming into self-awareness is a trauma that we are still dealing with because we still don't have the answers to the questions that that self-awareness brought up so that what what is life what is the purpose of life what is the meaning how do we live good, well how do we survive and then what happens before and after death? And like I say, I think what we are really asking when we bring up this question of what happens before life, what happens after death, is what makes a meaningful life? What makes a life worth living? Because I know it's going to end. So I, I don't really know that we're so much actually afraid of the end and the unknown, although we are. And that is, again, it's totally scary. Right? We're afraid of the unknowns within life, let alone the unknown of what happens after life. But also, it's that, it's that okay, well, if I don't know how this is going to end or I don't know what's going to happen afterwards, what is it that makes being alive good? What is it that makes it purposeful? What is it that if it's going to end, how do I do it well? And I think that we all kind of deal with that. Um, and I mean, of course, we have biology. And we all are biologically, at, like all other biology, 
life wanting to be life, life wanting to live, life wanting to continue. And so the idea that life is insecure and the fact that we are aware of that stresses us out because it goes against our biology. Yeah, like an animal just isn't sitting there thinking about its death all the time because it's not really aware of it. It's not aware of an, an attack until an attack is happening. And many people say that they dove into the consciousness of an animal and they're just like not aware of their own mortality. It's an instinct that comes up when they're being attacked or when their needs aren't being met and when they're in pain. Okay, so this is something we'll get into. But that whole thing of like us being aware of our mortality even when we're not under attack, even when we don't know what's going on, and like I say, and then, and then we have storytelling and meaning making and all of these things and wanting to make life meaningful. So we want to survive and we want to make life meaningful. And then the second thing is that we are aware of our separateness. Right? Our self-awareness has created an awareness that we're not just one with everything. We're not an amalgamation. We're not a part of, it, in so many ways, many of us don't even feel that we are a part of a system. We feel separate. We are aware of self. And in many ways, this makes us feel that we are not connected. And we crave this connection. We want to feel unified. We want to feel heard. We want to feel seen. We want to feel understood. We want to feel connected. And our self-awareness seems to contradict that. It's that every time we get this hit that it's like, you're not one with everyone. You can be rejected. You can be isolated. You can be, you can be kicked out. You can be that threat that we've been talking about in all of these videos. Your caregivers, upon whom you are completely dependent for everything, cannot like you, can abandon you, can reject you, and therefore you don't get your survival needs met. Your need for comfort, your need for warmth, your need for food, your need for shelter, your need for security, your need to know that someone out there is looking out for you, that we have as small children. That self-awareness of like, holy shit, I can be something that's separate from this thing that I am dependent upon and I have no control over. Right? Like, this is the first existential crisis of the human being, of that which provides for me. I don't understand and I don't have control over. And that which is causing what provides for me to not provide for me, I don't know what I'm doing or not doing to cause that to happen. And we can think of like early humans would have been having this relationship with the earth. That which I am dependent on for life can accept or reject me. Right when we look at superstition and the praying to the rain god and praying to the feast god and praying to the famine god and praying to the lion god and the sun god and the moon god and all these things. Projection of parenthood onto the reality. That which provides for me. I have no control over. It is a completely fickle, I don't understand how it works. Right? And we're going to give it that praise, that offering, that worship, because that's what we would want. And that's basically what superstition was. We're going to give to the earth what we think it would want to reward us with getting our needs met. And then children do that for their parents. We do this for then our society at large. And all of us are living in this complete codependent, human-centric consensus reality of if I just live up to the expectation of those around me, they will meet my needs. They will provide for me. Right? We, we're stuck in this childlike consciousness of I can't provide for myself. I can't figure out how reality works for myself. I can't provide for myself. Right? Give to me what I would need. If I'm rejected, 
I'm fucked. And we kind of have to, right? So these are the, these are the core traumas. That if we look at all of the problems on the planet, racism, sexism, homophobia, genocide, war, all of these battles, all of these things that we see on the planet and we look at them and we say like this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, it's all rooted in we are traumatized. We are aware of our mortality and we are aware of our separateness. And we don't know how to find security in the fact that we're going to die. And we don't know how to find community in our differences. We don't know how to say you and your perspective is never going to be exactly like mine. No one is ever going to know me. And I am never going to know someone else in the deepest purest sense because we are separated by our vantage point you will never have my lived experience I will never have your lived experience and everything that goes into creating my perception of myself and the world and and what I am can never be fully shared with someone else can never be fully understood by someone else because they have their vantage point. Even someone who's connecting with me to my vantage point is doing so through their own vantage point. With their own filters and their own experiences and their own assumed projections of reality on top of what they're seeing in me. So we're separate and we can't reconcile that. We can't change that. That's a reality. And we're mortal, right? And we're all chasing the Philosopher's Stone. We're all chasing. Maybe if we get spiritual enough, if we get healthy enough, if we get woke enough, if we get something enough, we won't die. Or we'll become so transcended within the body that we'll know that we know that we know what happens after death, right? Like this is a lot of what spirituality has turned into over the centuries. It's just we're, we're seeking and searching for that. We want to know what is going to happen after death so that we can stop being afraid of it in our life. And every religion, every spiritual practice, every doctrine has their, this is what we say happens after death. Right? Lots of spiritual people claim that they know like it's physics, right? Nothing is created or destroyed. It would make perfect sense that our souls carry on in some way. It would make sense that we came and it's like, okay, that could be true. It very much could be true. There are so many theories on this. And it's not to say that none of them are true or it could be that, you know, lots of them have parts of reality. But ultimately, as a spiritual person, I'm going to come out here and I'm just going to say, Anyone who is telling you that they know what happens after death is lying to you because they don't know, because you can't know. Because in reality, experience is how we know. Experience is how we learn. We don't know something until we have an experience of it. So even people who have had near-death experiences, who have died for a little while and come back, they didn't die. And hey, like I say, they may have the closest we have to knowing what happens after death. But again, through them, what we know is this seems to be what happens when you almost die. We don't know what happens when you die, die. So that's the first thing. No spiritual person can actually take away that fear for you. Could ever prove to you. Because that's the other thing even if someone is totally right about what happens after death. They can't convince you of it. Because again, for us as human beings, we learn through experience. We don't learn intellectually. We can't learn from someone else's experience. Not truly, not fully. We can get a very good understanding. We can get the textbook. We can get the theory of it. That's great. But until we've sat in the cockpit, we don't know how to fly an airplane. So, 
as much as we learn and we listen from others, a lot of the time, other people's stories don't make us feel better about the thing that we're going through because their experience doesn't change ours. And until our experience matches what we understand, we're not going to feel sure or strong in it. Okay? So that's the first thing. And then that connection part. That feeling separate. Okay. This is something that I understand can be very, very challenging. Because as someone who was born, and, and this is why, to me, spirituality isn't about the cities. Okay, the spiritual gifts. Because a lot of people equate unity consciousness, like being able to be connected to other people, being able to be psychic. So just perceiving time slightly differently, essentially. Watching patterns and seeing that there's cause and effect, that the world that we live in is structure. And when we drop a ball, it falls to the ground. So if I say that, am I psychic? No. I just understand patterns. So when, when we look at people who are psychic, a lot of the time, they're reading patterns. And they're just good at reading patterns. These cities of maybe you can fast for a really long time. Maybe you have visions. Maybe your brain works in that way. Maybe you, like I say, can intuit what, what other people are feeling. Or you can intuit on what other people are going through. I was born with a lot of those gifts. I didn't have to do anything to earn them. Right? I, I was born psychic. I was born being able to feel what's going on with other people's emotions. And so much so that I didn't know that that wasn't normal. I didn't know that everyone wasn't walking around feeling everybody's everything. I, for a really long time, didn't know that I was feeling everyone's everything. Right? It was a very confusing thing for me to grow up this way. So what I'm saying is there's a part of me that says, okay, well, I don't value that as being spiritual because I didn't have to work for it. I didn't have to do anything for it. It was just part of who I am. So if that's what makes someone spiritual, why is it that I just had it and other people have to do all this stuff to make it happen? So that's what I'm saying. I don't see that as a spiritual thing. Because, again, to me, what it means to be spiritual in a way that's actually productive for the world we live in right now. Okay? A light worker is someone who is able to embrace the humanity that is in trauma right now. Our own trauma, our own pain, our own suffering, and the suffering of everyone else. And rather than looking to fix it, change it, make it go away, get rid of it, deny it, suppress it, exaggerate it, any of these things. A truly spiritual person, a light worker, is able to say, okay, I connect with me. And rather than rejecting myself in my pain, I'm going to start to validate myself. I'm going to listen to myself. Because I have a fundamental understanding of what pain actually is. Okay? So to me, a spiritual person understands that pain does not equal guilt and shame. A spiritual person has done their work to recognize that there isn't judgment or punishment or condemnation in reality. When we get sick, we are not being punished. When we lose all our money, we're not being condemned. When we go through things that hurt, it has nothing to do with our worth or our value or the amount that we are being loved or unloved. It's simply that we live in a universe that has a structure. And when we break the structure, we break ourselves because we are one with the structure. We are one with everything. So again, I understand that a lot of the time people have to work really hard 
to have a unity experience, to have unity awareness. And that is something that leads you into someone who's capable of being a spiritual person, a light worker. When you can start to have compassion for yourself and compassion for others as though they are you. When we start to step away from this idea that things are going wrong, that people are being punished, that there are good and bad people, that there are people who are different from you so much so that they are completely unlike you, that you are separate from them. And rather than that, we start to get to a place where we say, like, no, if I had lived their life with everything that they've gone through, with their brain, with their body, with their genetic makeup, with their parents, with their religious upbringing, their education, I would be doing exactly what they're doing. Right? We're, we step out of this idea of everyone is me, just making dumber choices. Everyone has my understanding, everyone has my vantage point, and they're just doing things that I would never do because they're retarded. Right, even that word, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used it. Because they're stupid. Because they're not thinking. Because they're evil. Because they're wrong. Because they're bad. No. They are you, which is a completely different set of circumstances. And you would be doing exactly what they're doing right now. Because you wouldn't be you. In their body. You would be them. And we have to understand that, again, what we are seeing in pain is we are breaking the laws we don't even know exist. Because here's, again, a massive trauma that we as humanity are still grappling with. We are aware of our pain. We are complex enough to take that pain and say, okay, we're breaking the laws of the universe. How am I living in a way that's out of sync with reality? Our problem solving skills. We have that. But we have such a low awareness of the rules, the structure, that we're constantly breaking ourselves against them. And looking like we're being punished, looking like we're being hurt, looking like we're being condemned. When really it's just, it's completely neutral. Reality changes for no one. And as harsh as this is, reality, if a little baby who doesn't even yet have the capacity to understand fire and getting burnt and their body falls into a fire or puts their hand into a fire, does reality say, okay, they weren't old enough or are aware enough to understand that that was going to hurt them, so we're not going to let them get burnt? No. That baby gets burnt. Because reality doesn't change for anybody. Reality doesn't augment itself. It's neutral. It's a structure. And therefore, we are learning about ourselves. We are learning about reality through breaking ourselves against these rules. And when we are wise, right, when we are a spiritual person, we start to be able to get on to pain. Okay? We develop a completely different relationship with pain. So here's my definition of a spiritual person. Someone who has developed a more mature relationship with pain than the average person. And who therefore knows how to learn about the structure and nature of reality through pain and pleasure without denying or trying to get away from pain and without chasing pleasure because there's there's a higher understanding that pain and pleasure are not what make a life good or bad that there's something fundamentally deeper okay the connection part that the more we connect to ourselves the more we learn about ourselves and the more we learn about reality that that is what brings forth satisfaction, right? It, it's not about chasing accomplishment or 
uh, consensus reality, what, what the world tells us right now, will make us feel good. To be approved of, to be given what we need, to be safe and secure. And this is a lot of the time why people who have had the darkest lives tend to have the most inner peace and the most awareness. Because it, a lot of the time, we do need to face losing everything we think we need. Everything we think we require to be happy, to survive, to live. And in losing that, we realize that we have the capacity to choose life within whatever circumstances. And, and even to a, a point where we, 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 are, we get to a point where we can hold life with an open hand. Okay, so I'm going to just express from my point of view. I've had many near-death experiences. And I've had many experiences in my life where just everything that I held sacred, everything I held important, everything I thought I needed to be happy, to be healthy, to have security, all of my indoctrinated, if I don't have this, something really bad is going to happen. I've faced a lot of that. I've gone through periods of just not knowing if I was going to make it to tomorrow. And that can either be a new trauma, or it can be something that allows us to say, okay, I don't know if I'm going to be able to understand this pain enough to make a change enough that I get to survive. And I don't know what's going to happen when I die. I have ideas. I have feelings, but ultimately, I don't know. And ultimately, I don't know when my time is going to come. I don't have control over that in a lot of ways. As much as I can do everything that I can do, I don't have control. Right? And, and we get to that point where we realize control isn't the thing. Security isn't the thing acceptance and love and and the promise of another day isn't what's going to make the fear go away isn't what's going to make that hollow thing in our chest the trauma that we are all living with go away because that's not the answer and and because in reality there just isn't that we are never going to get smart enough, capable enough, aware enough that we're in control of what's going on around us. Again, we're a part of a collective of people we have no control over. Not one of us can say, I'm going to stop the storm from coming. Right? Human error. We can get on an airplane and it can crash and we have no control over that, right? Life is a continual calculated risk. And we feel that in our nervous systems. We do. And when we are attaching our sense of security and our sense of safety and our sense of self to just this little body and this life lived experience and all the microness of that, we are going to live in anxiety. We're going to live in fear. And, and like I said, like, right, we're, we're chasing these spiritual experiences so much of the time because it's in these spiritual experiences that we have a break from feeling so alone. That we have a break from feeling so out of control. That we feel connected to something higher. We feel connected to each other. We feel connected to ourselves for the first time. And and ultimately, like I say, we're crying out in pain as a humanity. Because we haven't yet gotten on to the fact that security in the external world is never going to happen. 
We are not going to find our peace in the stuff of the earth. And we're not even going to find our peace from each other. We're not going to find our peace from each other because nothing is consistent. The only constant in reality is change. The only constant in reality is change. The only constant in our reality is change. So as spiritual people, seek to find enlightenment. Seek to find heaven. Seek to find the answers. Are constantly striving for when I get here, when I do this, when I accomplish that, when I get there, right? I think a lot of the time when we're thinking, when I am so spiritual that I can meditate and just manifest anything I want, that will mean that I'm at a place where I no longer have my fear of death. That will mean that I'm at a place where I no longer feel separated. We are projecting onto these spiritual people and onto these spiritual gifts, meaning that those things don't give us. Because again, I can tell you from my personal experience, I have those things. I've experienced. I can put myself in someone else's body. I've experienced knowing exactly what was going to come next. I've experienced, I can read my husband's thoughts. When we're on a walk, my sister will vouch for me. <laughs> and we're talking, and he thinks about something else, I can tell that he dropped off in our conversation. Because the boundaries between me and other people are so leaky. So I'm there. And do I have perfect peace? No. Do I know what happens after death? I can't say any more than anyone else. And I'm being honest about that. I am not so sure in my perception of reality that I'm going to say I have it correct. Because how can I prove that? I can't even prove it to myself. So, like, I have ideas, and that's great, but they're not, I'm not holding on to that as being my security. And like I say, I have this capacity to connect with God, whatever people say that is, to get answers for myself. When I'm sick, what do I do? Oh, I get it. Okay, I see the system. I can, like, see what's going on inside my own body. See, I have these gifts, but ultimately, that doesn't make me a spiritual person. It doesn't make my life any better. And in a lot of ways, it made my life worse. It made my life so confusing. Because all that connection meant that I didn't know where I ended and you start. And your pain and misalignment is my pain and misalignment. So it's not just a clear, okay, I can see that I'm doing something out of alignment with truth. Because it's just my pain. I feel everyone's pain. So now, does that mean that I might be in pain for the rest of my life because humanity is never going to be fully in alignment? Maybe. And that could be what it is for empaths. It really could be that we're aligning ourselves as much as we can, and we're still going to feel like shit sometimes. We're still going to have that pain sometimes. Because we're connected. We realize it's not just us. We can feel the misalignment of everyone else. And it's just a part of our experience. So those people who don't have that connection maybe feel more isolated, feel more alone, have less of that sense of bliss of connection that can just happen from inside yourself. But at the same time, they feel less pain. They do. They have less pain. They have less actual nervous system going on in their body awareness because they're not so connected to everybody else. And so when we say that we're a spiritual person, how do you support yourself and others in walking through their pain? That is my definition of a light worker. Someone who is not interested in telling someone that they're wrong. Someone who is not interested in telling someone that their perspective is incorrect. They just need to think positive. They just need to change their mind. They just need to believe me about this is what it is. You're being silly with your fear. You're being silly with your pain. You're being silly. I'm writing you off. Someone who's judgmental. Someone who doesn't want to hear what someone is saying. 
When someone comes to us in pain and we say, no, 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 that's not love and light. I can't deal with that negativity. That's someone who has judgment about pain. And we all do. We have that conditioning. Pain means I am wrong and bad. Pain means I am bad. Guilt and shame. Something is going wrong. My security has just been robbed from me. That's indoctrination, but also normal. We all came by that, naturally. And honestly, from our upbringings, from our parents who were in pain and didn't know. Right? We're projecting the childlike consciousness of I don't have control over what's happening. I don't understand why my pain is this way. But I am dependent upon these caregivers who seem to have the magical capacity to take my pain away. Right? When we're zero to seven and we're in pain and we cry out and mom and dad solve it, that's magic to us. We have no idea what they just did. We have no idea why the pain was there. We have no idea how they took it away. And when they can't, oh no, something's wrong, and they can't take it away, the only thing I have control over is myself, my behavior. So maybe if I manipulate them, maybe if I stop crying, maybe if I stop doing this or this or this, I won't be getting it rejected, and then they'll take my pain away. And then we live our lives like this, where we project that out onto the universe. We project that out onto everyone around us. What do I need to do and who do I need to be so that I will be approved of, so that when I'm in pain that I don't understand, others will take it away from me. Others will make it better. It will go away if we all agree I didn't do anything wrong. You see, we have these philosophical debates about what's the best diet. And in reality, that's a ridiculous thing. It should just be go and do it. If you're getting the results you want, you don't need to debate with anybody. You're getting good results. Results, reality is telling you. If you're not getting the results you want, it doesn't matter if you convince the whole world. Yeah, but science and this study and this study and this study and this study proves it. Okay, sure, but do you still have diabetes? Well, then it didn't work. It doesn't matter. <laughs> There's no debate to be had. And I think this is something we as a humanity need to start to get a hold of. We're debating with humans that also have no control over what reality is. Stop debating with reality. Stop debating with other humans. Look at results. How is it working? How does it feel? Right? Again, another per part of spirituality to me is someone who is developing emotional mastery. In the sense that we're not just swayed by our emotions. Because again, a lot of us interpret our emotions incorrectly. We're in pain, we think that pain means we're wrong and bad. No, no, no. That's an incorrect interpretation. Pain means I have just broken myself against the bounds of reality. So what are the bounds of reality? This is learning experience. And in order to be alive, I have to be constantly bumping up against the limits of reality. Because I need to be continually learning. Because in order to be continually alive, I need to be growing. And in order to be growing, I need to be getting new information. So anyone who's telling you that they have transcended pain, that's a dangerous place to be on earth. If you don't feel pain anymore, you put your hand on a burner, it burns your hand off. To not be able to feel pain. Okay? To not be able to feel pain is a detriment. People who don't have pain sense in their bodies are at the highest risk of death because they don't have that messenger letting them know, don't do this, this is against your biology. So emotional pain, mental pain, spiritual pain, a light worker says, okay, that pain is happening for a reason. Let's investigate. Where is that pain coming from? Why is that pain there? What is the pain telling you about yourself and about the structure? About your misunderstandings? About the way you perceive reality that is not how reality works? Because all of us are continuing in this life to try to get our needs met. That's what we're all doing. 
Every single one of us, every single day, are living to get our needs met. And those of us who have relative physical security, the need we're mostly trying to get met is self-expression. The existential crisis that most of us are having all the time. Who am I? What's my purpose? What is the meaning of life? That's where we're at. Who am I? What's my purpose? What's the purpose of life? That's where we're at. That's the pain we're feeling right now. And we also have the pain of like, yes, right? Our lifestyles are completely against our biology in a lot of ways. Sitting at a desk under fluorescent lights in front of screens that are irradiating our faces, eating food that isn't food, never being outside. There's pain because of that. There's pain because we truly believe that if we're not accepted and approved of, we're going to die. So we try to get rid of ourselves. Okay, and again, this is a huge part of the human conundrum. We feel disconnected. And we perceive that that disconnection is coming because we are different. Because we're not what people expect us to be. Because we're not approved of. So we try and get rid of ourselves. Hi, Mike. In order to be more accepted. But we don't recognize that to truly be alive on earth right now as a human being is to be yourself. To be the little fractal of God that you are and to express that. That connection comes from you. It comes from you. You. Your connection to reality. The more you are connected to who you are, what you want to express, what you want to be on this planet, what you want to say, what you want to create, the more connected you are going to feel to everyone and everything else. The more you try to get rid of yourself in order to be approved of, the less and less and less and less you are going to feel connected. You're going to get those hits of consensus reality approval when someone approves of you for what you have acted to be but it's going to feel hollow and it's going to feel shameful and it's going to feel terrible and it's going to feel like it's constantly, you're constantly having to jump through hoops. The more you lose yourself, the less you're going to feel connected to anything. And the more you connect with yourself, the more you may have experiences where people reject you, where humans tell you, no, I don't like you. I don't want to be around you. I don't, you lose the consensus. And I'm going to tell you, that is an experience that I have been through. I have lost almost everyone at some point. I have had to face the fact that me being me, my family of origin is never going to get it. Me being me means I don't have their approval. Most people I grew up with don't get me. I lost everyone. <laughs> from my upbringing to be who I am now, pretty much. And I feel more connected to everyone and everything now than I ever did trying to fit in. My connection to God came from understanding I wasn't going to feel connected to the humans around me and letting that go I let it die and it's the only reason I've been able to live my life the way that I live it where this is just me you could come hang out with me in real life and there is nothing different about who and what I am in my day-to-day -day and what I present to you here on social media it's not a curated version I get sad I get angry, I get triggered, I'm a human being, I have pain, and I have no problem telling you that I have pain, and I have not transcended pain, and I will not transcend pain, and I don't want to transcend pain, and I don't know what happens after we die. Because none of those things make me a spiritual person or not a spiritual person. What makes me a spiritual person is I can hold space for people who are in pain. And I'm learning how to hold space for myself when I'm in pain. That, to say this isn't my fault. There's nothing wrong with me. 
I'm acting in ways that oppose the structure that I was trained. So how can I change? I think there's something else that my sister will vouch for me. When I realize that what I'm doing is out of alignment with the structure, I don't sit around and berate myself and shame myself and think about how horrible of a person I am. I drop it like it's hot. And I'm excited that I just learned, oh, that's what was causing me pain. Something I was doing was causing me pain? That's a cell of frickin' bration. Right? Because I'm not sitting here trying to pretend that I'm perfect and that I have everything figured out. Because if I still have pain, I don't have everything figured out. And so long as I'm alive, I will never have everything figured out. Because in order to be alive, I have to be continually growing. And in order to be growing, I have to be taking in new information. So I have no shame about learning that something that I was doing was wrong. Because it wasn't wrong. It was a step on the path. Just like all of us are on a step on the path. All of us are doing the best we know to do. And we want to make judgments. And we want to say that people know better. And we want to say that people should be doing better. And all this. But it's not true. When we really know better, we do better. And when we, we might know in our heads better. But if our bodies haven't learned. If we haven't kinesthetically learned. If we don't get it from reality. Why what we're doing is causing harm. And what we need to do different. And that there's a better way. Because that's the other thing. All of us who are doing these seemingly harmful to ourselves and harmful to others' behaviors. It's the only way we know how to get our needs met. And it's just, it comes down to that. Narcissists don't know how to meet their needs any other way. They are in such a state of stress, in such a, such a state of fear, in such a state of shame and guilt that they harm others seemingly on purpose. Because that is the only way they know. It's either dominate or be dominated. Victims and victimizers, it's a loop for a reason. Victimizers don't know how to get their needs met other through dominating. We dominate people, the, victimi the victims, the victimizers dominate the victims. And then the victims usually become victimizers because they learn, this is the only way I know how to get my needs met. It's the rare person who is dominated, who is victimized, who says, okay, I'm going to take control where I really have it. And that's over myself. And then doesn't turn that into a self-shame thing and a self-blame thing and a this self-help path where we go into, no, okay, I'm just a human being with needs. How can I connect with reality and work with the system so as to get my needs met? That's an intelligent spiritual person. I'm in pain. I have needs that aren't getting met. I'm going to validate that in myself. And then I'm going to look for the systems. I'm going to look for the structure. Not what humans think. Not consensus reality. What gets me results where I'm not harming someone else? That is a spiritual person. So whether that means you take care of others or you literally never interact with another human being ever again. But you're living in a way of how can I get my needs met in the least harmful way for myself and others. You're a spiritual person. You're a light worker. When someone comes to you and they're in pain, and someone comes to you and they're expressing in pain, so they're violent, they're angry, they're, they're all victimizers. We look at that and we say, pain, trauma. They may not recognize it, right? We may not be the ones that are going to help them get over it. But a spiritual light worker doesn't say, evil person, bad person, something wrong with them, they are other than me. A spiritual person says, pain, trauma, pain and trauma. If that person ever needs space, I'll be that space. I won't be abused. I will hold my own ground. But I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to the patterns of humanity right now. I'm not going to go... And I'm, I'm going to listen to all the voices. And then I'm going to look at the voice behind the voice. Who's talking? Who's saying this is what the reality is? And why might they be saying that? How is that their vantage point? It, they came upon it honestly. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's true. 
But where are they coming from? What are the patterns we're seeing here? What are the patterns of pain in humanity? And how can I change my way of being so that I don't continue to contribute to that pattern without going into shame and blame? Because we all were learned, we all learned how to be abusive to ourselves and to others. That's humanity right now. What we think of as normal is just abuse to self and others. So none of us can sit here and say, it's my fault. It isn't. But what am I going to do with my pain and what am I going to do with other people's pain? Am I going to reject it? Am I going to try to fix it? Am I going to try and get rid of the symptom? Don't be like that. Don't do that. Think of it in another way. Or am I going to be someone who understands how human psychology works? And that is, when we feel safe, when we are validated in whatever we're in, we will process, and in that processing, we will find our power to shift to a new way of being without the shame and guilt. And that is what's going to create a new world. So light workers respond to people who are in pain, who are dealing with the existential crises of life the way we respond to ourselves, with love, compassion, understanding, and curiosity. What can we learn from the pain that we're in? Oops, sorry so that we can change our way of being to better align with how reality works. That is a light worker. I'm not trying to get rid of the runny nose. I want to understand the virus. I want to understand the body so that we can support the body and then I don't have to have a runny nose anymore. I'm not going to take something to suppress the symptom. I'm not going to say my body is broken. My body is working perfectly. If I didn't get a runny nose, I'd die from the virus. If I didn't get angry, I'd die from the thing that's suppressing me. If I didn't get sad, I'd have no idea that I'm being disempowered. And now as an adult, I'm going to get over the childlike shame that I'm doing something wrong and therefore I'm bad. And change means I was bad before. So now I have to just justify what I'm doing. I have to stay stuck in what I'm doing to keep my worldview of myself. And we start to say, no, I'm good fundamentally. And I'm making tons of mistakes. And that's life. That's what life is. So we develop a new relationship with pain. We develop a new relationship with the unknown. And our fear. And it, that new relationship is compassion and curiosity. And where can we make changes? And where can we just embrace that we're never going to know? And life, a meaningful life, is not one that is secure. A meaningful life is one where... I lived myself today. I could die tomorrow and I'd be okay. Not because I feel like I accomplished everything. Not because I feel like I did everything right. Not because I'm perfect. But because I know every day I'm living myself. I'm doing the fullest me that I can do. And that's it. That's what gives life meaning and purpose. I'm living my fullest me. I'm learning as much as I can. I'm open to the experience of whatever my experience is going to be. Where I have control over it, where I don't. That's purpose. That's meaning. That's it. There's no guarantees. So I'm just going to be myself. I'm going to embrace pain as a messenger. And I'm going to investigate where is that pain coming from. So what needs to shift so that we don't have that pain. I'm going to acknowledge and validate the pain in everyone else. They are not separate from me. You want a unity experience? Start looking at everyone around you and say, that is who I would be if I were them. So if I can't understand their choices, step out of your perspective and start to get curious about theirs. You don't need ayahuasca for a unity experience. Ask yourself, how is it that I would get to where that person is? To believing what they believe, to doing what they do. How can I take down my defenses that I'm right? You want to be a spiritual person. How do you show up for pain? Yours and others. That is true spirituality. Okay? So that's it. I hope you have a fabulous day, a fabulous night, whenever you're watching this. I love you so much. And be safe. And you're good enough. And you are connection point. You be you.